Can I ask you now, <laughs> let's get into, into the sermon for this morning. How many of you after last week were very much aware of this pride humility thing this past week? All right. I'm so glad because God's been on my case on this thing for the, for the last couple of weeks. Because you must remember, I, I prepare these things maybe two weeks in advance. And, and so that means even before that, God starts working in my heart about something. And so I don't come to this pulpit. I want you to know this. I don't come to this pulpit having sorted all of this stuff out in my heart and, and in my life. I'm, I'm growing in these areas as much as you are, all right, and have. And so, um, you know, I think this last week for most of us, it's almost like, you know, you have a sore thumb. Suddenly you wear the thumb, don't touch my thumb, you know, and you're aware of it. And, but last week, you know, you're operating and you don't even think of your thumb. You don't even think of that. And it's exactly the same with this whole pride humility thing. And I think it's a really good thing that we're just aware of it and that we deal with this. Because most of us, most of us don't realize how important this is to God. And we don't even realize that God's not displeased with, with pride. He actually hates it. Do you know Proverbs chapter 6 lists six things that God hates? Do you know what's right at the top of the list? Pride. Let's have a look at it on the screen. A proud look. That's what it says. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 8. Look, listen to what chapter 8 says. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. God absolutely hates it, wants nothing to do with it, and shouldn't surprise us because that's the very thing that got Satan kicked out of, out, out of heaven. That was the first, the, the original sin. Now, you and I can be humble in most areas of our lives, you know, uh, uh, especially if you compare yourself to somebody else who's, who's very proud and arrogant, and you look at that, and you think, man, I'm nothing like that. And so it's almost like the forefront of your life looks okay, but it's in the background where we often have a little bit of pride, where pride is, is lurking, it's hiding in the backyard. The front yard looks pretty good, and it's normally... In the areas that we're excelling. And so you'll find, you know, if you're doing well in your spiritual life, you could have a little bit of pride there because, you know, look at what I'm doing. And, and if you're doing well in your job and doing well in your, in your sport, sometimes for some people it's if they're doing well in their, in their finances and their investments and stuff like that. It could, it could be an area of pride. For others, it's their children. You know, and, and so, you know, the children are excelling in other academics or sport or something. And, and so there's, there's, there's a little bit of pride there. And so you find whenever somebody is constantly talking about something, constantly talking about their business, could be pride. I'm not saying there is. There could be pride. It points that way. When somebody is constantly talking about their children, or should I rather say bragging about their children, there's, there's pride there. Or you find people constantly talking about their money and what they've done and so on, there's, there's pride there. And so we've got to be careful in those areas. It's just, when that happens, it's almost like a little red light flashing on our dashboard, just saying, just be careful, just be careful. Walk in humility in, in this area. Do you know they say the most dangerous time for a young pilot is around 100 hours? Not the first three or four hours, by the way, when they know absolutely nothing. Not, not the first 30 or 40 hours, but the first 100 hours. When they hit around 100, why is it? And by the way, just to put it in perspective, do you know when they go solo, the first solo flight, around 15 hours? I mean, that's scary. You know, you want to, you know, when, when is that guy going solo? Let's run and hide. Let's get into a bunker or something, you know. 15 hours. But they say the most dangerous time is around the 100 hour mark. Why? Because they've gained experience, experience, experience. What comes with experience? Confidence, confidence, confidence. You know, I can do this now. And what comes with that? Pride. Exa pilot, my own. <laughs> and so, 
And so I'm not picking on pilots at all. Please, 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 please. This, listen, let, let me say, let me say, in the same way, whenever you and I get to a place where we feel, you know, I, I can do this now. I'm okay, because that's what happens to a young pilot. They've done 100 hours. I'm okay. I, I think I can do this. That's a dangerous place, because then we're not cautious anymore. And it's exactly the same in our own lives. Whenever we think, I, I'm okay, I can handle it, look at my business, look at this, look at that. That's a, it's, just, it's just a very dangerous place to be. Because pride has a way of, of sneaking up on us where we don't even realize it. You and I generally don't see it, but everybody else does. They say it's like bad breath. You're the last one to find out, all right? And, and so, you, you know, when you have family come and visit, long lost family that haven't been for a long time, and they come and visit and they walk in, they see your kids and they want to know whose kids these are. You know, and it's, it's, it's ours, but the last time they saw them, they were down there, and now they're up here, and it's like, whoa! And, but you and I don't see that, because, because we've, we've seen them grow slowly and gradually. We don't see that sudden thing. They see it. Pride is exactly the same way. Others see it. You and I don't. You know, since he's got that new job, he's changed. Since her business took off, and now suddenly she's making money, she's changed. You know, since she's married that guy, there's been such a change. And so what's happening? Others see it before you and I see it. And, and so how do we deal with that? <laughs> Very simple. Ask God, the, the Holy Spirit, and ask a friend to point it out. Simple as that. Just come to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, you need to, you need to talk to me. If there's stuff in my life, if there's a, if there's a, a measure of pride that, that I'm not, just point it out to me, just point it out. And then go to a good friend, a godly friend, and just say, you know what, if, if you see anything in my life, then, then point it out. And sometimes we need to do the same thing in terms of our children. You see, you know, us spoiling the children and, and, and so on, talk to me because I, I don't even see that. And so it's good to have somebody else point that out because pride has a way of, of sneaking up on us, but it also has a way of hiding. We, we, we don't really see it, but others see it. It's not in the foreground. It's in the background, not in the, in, in, in the, in the front yard. It's in the, in the backyard. But, but you know what? <laughs> Man. I love it when people use my title, doctor, professor, pastor. You know, that's, what it, that's why when my name pops up on the screen, you'll notice there's no pastor, there's no senior pastor, nothing like that. I've asked them, put Leonard. That's all people need to know. I think they figured I'm a pastor by now, all right? But you see, for some people, oh, no, 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 they make an appointment. Can, 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 you know, I want to make an appointment for for, for, for Dr. So-and-so. And, and, and so what happens? We like it when others see our title, when others see what we drive, when others know what our children have accomplished. And so, you know, it, it's, it's pride. And it's, and it's so small, and it's not in the foreground, but it, it's in the background, and that's, it's a little area. And so if we're going to grow in this area... If we're going to walk in humility, <laughs> all I'm saying is we've got to deal with those little areas in, in, in our lives. And there's stuff in my life, I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not nearly as humble as what I thought I was. All right. Because God has been, been working in, in my life. And, and I'm just saying, Lord, sort this stuff out because I want your blessing upon my life. Now, let me just clarify again. And I think I touched on this last week, but, but I need to say it again. Humility doesn't mean we can't be confident. Some people think, you know, to be humble, you must be soft-spoken, almost timid. Don't look people in the eye. You know, you must, you must. Man, that's being an introvert, man. You know, that's not, that's not being humble. <laughs> you can, listen, you can be bold and confident, but yet have such a humility. And I believe that's how God wants us to live, with a boldness and a confidence, but with humility. Listen to what Scripture says. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, 
You see, arrogance and pride says, look at me. Look at what I've accomplished. This is me. A godly confidence says, yes, this is me. But if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for God working through me, I wouldn't be able to accomplish what I have and be it in my career and be it with my children or, or businesses or whatever. And, and so we, we firmly planted in, in it's the goodness of God upon our lives. You know, you're going to have a look at Scripture. You'll see that our, our spiritual lives are likened to a fight. Paul says again and again in the New Testament, he says, he says fight the good fight. Run the race. Why, why is that? Because there are areas in your life and my life that we can't be casual about. It's not going to come right through casualness. We're going to have to be aggressive about it. We're going to have to fight this thing called sin and bad habits and, and, and pride. And, and by the way, pride is not just a bad habit. By the way, it's a sin according to Matthew chapter 7. And so we've got to be aggressive about this, and we've got to fight it. You say, how do we do that? And so last week, I gave you one step already. This morning, I want to recap on that one quickly, and I'm going to give you two more steps. So let's quickly have a look at the three steps. Number one, we said humble people focus on others. It's not all about me. But we start taking the attention, the focus, because most of us, our, our attention is, is inward focused, you know, what I think and what I like and, you know, am I cool enough? Am I good enough? Everybody is focusing on me and God says, take your eyes off yourself. Everything does not revolve around you. So listen to what it says. Don't be selfish and don't try to impress others. So in other words, if we're constantly trying to impress somebody, that's not being uh, uh, humble because, because we're basically saying, look, look at me, look at me. And then it says, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. And then verse 4, don't look out only for your own interests. Why does he say that? Because we do that. <laughs> but take an interest in others too. And so we said last week, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Not being so caught up with ourselves. Do you know one of the telltale signs of humility is how we treat others? Especially those that we see, and I want to say this carefully, that we see as less important than ourselves, you know, they, they're not, they're not on, on, on our level, and James warns us about this in chapter 2, and he says, don't show favoritism, he says, don't, don't think you're in any way better than somebody else, don't look down upon somebody, you are not more important, because to God, everybody is important, God loves the little person, Who's the little person? There's so many people today walking around seeing themselves as, as little and insignificant. And I'm not that important. Because society has done that. And society has put people down. I mean, just, just think about it. So often you find, you know, in the workplace, oh, no, 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 no. You know, I've been there, I've been there a couple of years. They've just joined, you know. I'm, I'm far ahead of them. And so we see ourselves as more important than somebody else. At school, a grade or two below us, oh no, 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 we don't even mix with them, you know? And so the, the, the guy in, watching our cars in the parking lot, the, the parking attendant, the guy at the traffic light, do we see ourselves as more important? Because I can tell you, God doesn't. God doesn't. And as a matter of fact, Jesus says to us, He says, I don't want you to just see them as kind of important and on the same kind of level. He says, I actually want you to take it a step further. He says, I want you to love them. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. He says, don't judge them. Do not be critical toward them. I want you to love them. And do you know that's one of the most important commandments 
in the Bible. When they asked Jesus what the most important one was, what did he say? To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength. And that's why you and I call that the greatest commandment. And then he says, and the second one I'm about to give you right now is equally important, equally. Love your neighbor. You say, how can that be? You want to tell me it's just as important to love people as it is to love God? Absolutely. And so whenever you and I judge others, that's the fruit of pride. Whenever we critical about others, and I'm, I'll put up my hand there and say, I have been often, that's the fruit of pride. God says, you do that? You, you think you're better than somebody else? <laughs> because look at what they, and, and that's pride. And so when you and I walk around saying, you know, I, I can't believe what they've just done. You know, that's so stupid. I would never, <laughs> given the right circumstances, at the right time, or you could say the wrong time. <laughs> Who knows what you and I are capable of? And so never, ever, ever look at somebody else and say, you know, I would never. And Derek, good to see you in, in church. He was in hospital this week, and your place was empty last week. Good to see you here. Bless you. And so let's never look down upon, upon somebody else. Let's move on. Number two, how do we stay humble? Humble people focus on others. Number two, hope, humble people are grateful. And so humility is often characterized as genuine gratitude. Genuine gratitude. You know, gratitude says, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the goodness of God, the grace of God upon my life. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for God. I wouldn't accomplish what I am if it, if it wasn't for God. God has just been so, so good to me. And let me tell you, that's the story of my life. And so I've, I've shared with you before, I've, I've developed a couple of habits in my life that have just worked for me. It's good to do that. Whatever works for you, you know, uh, uh, let it become a habit. So one of my habits, when I go to bed at night, when I put my head on the, on the pillow before I fall asleep, I just quickly reflect on my day. You know, how did my day go? How did I treat the people, you know, that I interacted with? You know, a am I proud of that? If I had a redo, if I could rewind, would I, would I redo that? Would I do it differently? And so I just reflect on that. Why do I do that? Because otherwise I go in tomorrow and do exactly the same thing. And I treat people exactly the same way. Sometimes I do. And then I reflect that night and I think, oh, Leonard, don't do that, don't do that, or don't say that, or don't, don't think that, that wasn't good. And so that helps me to break bad habits and bad patterns and, and, and to live in a God-honoring way. And so that's just something I do every night when I put my head on the pillow. But there's something else that I do when I wake up in the morning before I get up. And I've shared this with you before. Gratitude. I did it again this morning. I just lie there for a couple of moments and I just thank God for whatever comes to mind. No two mornings are exactly the same. I just, I just thank God because I want my life, I want my day to start with, with gratitude. Because I found gratitude helps me to stay humble. <laughs> God, <laughs> I, if it wasn't for you allowing me to breathe this morning, I wouldn't be able to breathe. Thank you so much. All right. Enough said on that one. Let's move on quickly to number three, the last one. Humble people serve. Humble people serve. The greatest leaders are servant leaders. Greatest leaders. We looked at a couple of examples the last week. I showed you Moses, Jesus, Paul. Greatest leaders are, are servant leaders. Let me give you an example, uh, not a biblical example, everyday life, real example. In the book, Good to Great, and I've mentioned it before, the author there, Jim Collins, uh, does a survey on 1,435 top, top companies in the United States. So let's just round it off. Let's just say 1,400. And so they studied these companies, and they found these were 1,400 of, of the best companies in the States. But in that group, there was 11 just on another level. So these were really good, but there were 11 that were great. And they wanted to know what, what takes you from good 
to great. And so he sent his research team into those companies to go and do research, to go and spend time with them. And he gave them this instruction. He said to them, I don't want to know about the CEOs. Don't come back and tell me about, about the executives and the leaders and so on. I, I want to know what's happening on the ground. I want to know the culture in the companies and so on. And so, long story short, these guys came back and they said, we've discovered something uh, 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 consistently unusual in these, these 11 companies. And so he said, all right, tell me. And they said, well, you told us not to look at the CEOs, and we started at the bottom, we promised, but it, it pointed toward the top every single time. Well, what is it? They're all servant leaders. Every single one of them. And they just started describing these people as selfless and humble and, and gracious. And so they were there not to make as much money as they could and to further their career, and they're not paying bonuses to staff, and they're not looking after the staff. They were there to further the company and further the staff before, before they further themselves. They had a servant heart. And so it didn't mean that they were weak and pathetic. Oh, no. It was like servant leaders. And that's what I love about servant leaders. It's like two sides of a coin. There's the serving side and there's the leading side. And so you'll find with a servant leader, oh, man, you know, they, they're able to make the tough calls. They, they're able to, to do the tough stuff if they really have to. But they don't hesitate to serve. As a matter of fact, you'll find with servant leaders, they actually look for an opportunity to, to, to serve. You see, proud people, I, I employ people to do that. I, I, I don't do that. That's not humility. Do you know Jesus didn't operate like that? Jesus never put himself on, on a pedestal, and I don't do that anymore. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, but to serve. And then he demonstrated it by washing his disciples' feet. And this is what he said. Let me read it to you quickly. In John 13, he says, after he'd washed their feet, he, he asked him this question, do you understand what I've done for you? And clearly they didn't, but it's not a problem because he was about to explain it to them in any case. He says to them, he says, you call me teacher and Lord. So in other words, you've elevated me. You see me up there. I'm above you. I'm your leader. Which, which he says, he says, and rightly so, for that is who I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And so what he's saying to them, just as I have served you today as your Lord and your, your teacher, your rabbi. He says, just as I have, now just go out and, and serve one another. Now, let me, just, let me just say, that doesn't mean that you've got to go home now and go and get a dish and wash your wife's feet. She didn't walk to church on a dirt road, all right? But you may want to wash your car. Or you may, may want to do the dishes for her. All right, don't do the washing. That's her job. All right, don't, 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 don't. don't. <laughs> but you know what Jesus is saying? Just serve. Just, just serve. That's what he's saying. Do you know that most marital problems and unhappiness is rooted in selfishness? You know, when we sit with couples going through a difficult time, he did this, and she said that, and, and, and all of that. We don't focus on that. that. That's the fruit. Where does it come from? And we, we try and ascertain what, what is the root that's causing this nonsense in the marriage. And you know, most of the time can be traced back to selfishness. Do you know that most marital bliss is rooted in serving? You want to have a great marriage, just start serving. You, you want to show your spouse you really love them, just serve. You want to have really just happiness in the home. Oh, you've got to earn a lot of money, I'm telling you. 
No, 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 no. Start serving. Start serving. And then take it a step further. Now, please hear me now. Help or encourage the others in your home to do the same. So you'll say to your child, hey, clean up the bathroom quickly. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I never asked if it was you. <laughs> now it was, it was, why don't you serve them? We teach our children to serve themselves. Mom is not always going to make you tea and coffee, and that's good. Serve yourself. Mom is not always going to serve yourself. I'm asking us. That's good. But take it a step further and help them to serve others. Not just the one person in the home. Because you'll typically find there's one person always serving. And the others are leeching off that one. And it's wrong. We must, let's encourage one another. Let's serve one another and let the children see that and, and we all work together to that. You want to have a happy home? You don't have to earn double. I'm telling you, you just start serving one another and you see what happens. The moment you do that, you start hel helping other people. Man, you're going to start living, living your best life. You know, I found so many people today are living for themselves and they cannot understand why they're so miserable <laughs> because they're living for themselves. <laughs> and so they think, you know, if I can just earn more money and then they earn more money and they're still not happy, but, but just a little bit more and then they earn a little bit more and just a little bit and it never ends. It's just it keeps going, and they're never happy. No, no, but if I can just buy that, if, if, if I can just acquire that, and then they get it. And sure, there's temporary excitement and joy and happiness, but it soon fades. Novelty wears off. Well, when you and I click this thing that God has made us to serve one another, that's when you start living your best life. And so you, you start serving and helping and blessing and taking your eyes off yourself and just, just start looking at other people, that's when, when life really starts, starts having meaning, where you start enjoying it. Because life was never meant just to get, but to give. And so that's why the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Those who refresh others, the Bible says, will themselves be refreshed. All right. So let me end off quickly with this last story. And there's such a lesson for us in this. There's a guy in the Bible by the name of Naaman. Naaman was the commander of the Syrian army. So he was, he was a, a, a very prominent man. You know, um, everybody knew him. Um, you know, had a high standing in society and everything. People looked up to him and people served him and so on. But the problem was he had an incurable disease. And so he heard that there was a prophet over in Israel that could heal him. Uh, this prophet had a healing ministry. But the, pr the problem was that those were really their enemies. They were going through a time of, 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 of peace. But, but they, they, they were neighboring country. But they were, really, they were really enemies. So he goes to his king and he asks the king. He says, do you think... I could somehow get a hold of this, this prophet Elisha over in Israel that, that he could perhaps help me. And the king says, absolutely. I'll write you a letter to the king of Israel. And so the king does it, writes the letter. And, and, and uh, Naaman gets horses and chariots and bodyguards and soldiers and every whole entourage together. Goes over to Israel with this official letter, hands it to the king. And it's, it's, quite, it's kind of funny. Because the king has kind of the fright of his life. He, he's in panic because he looks at this and he says, am I supposed to heal this guy? He says to his people, he says, I can't heal this guy. Oh, is he crazy? Is that king trying to pick a fight with me? I mean, this is, this is crazy. And so fortunately, somebody in his court quickly contacts Elisha, quickly sends a text to Elisha's uh, uh, servant and says, hey, you know, the king is in trouble. There's somebody you know, from, from, from Syria needing healing and so on. And so they text back and say, ah, send him over here, send him over here. So that's exactly what happens. So the king says, oh man, 
there's this, there's this prophet, Elisha, and he's obviously thinking, yes, I know, it's actually why I'm here. Why don't you just go to his home and, and, and he'll help you? And so Naaman goes over there, and the Bible says, when, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. Why did he wait? Because there was nobody to welcome him. The king has just phoned, said, I'm sending a foreign dignitary. <laughs> Couldn't be bothered. Doesn't even go outside. No, no, no welcoming party or anything. And then it, it gets worse, by the way. But Elisha sent a messenger out with this. He doesn't even go out himself. Sends a messenger with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you'll be healed of your leprosy. So he doesn't even go out to, to, to see him. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I, I read that and I think, you know, that's kind of a little bit rude. You know, well, you don't even bother. You just send a messenger. You know, the least you can do, the king, the king has just sent somebody to your home. No, no problem, sir. I'll sort them out. I'll look after them. <laughs> he doesn't really do this. And so, needless to say, Naaman's a little bit ticked off. Listen to what the Bible says. Actually, the Bible doesn't say he was ticked off. But Naaman became angry and walked away. I thought he would certainly come out to, be, to meet me. Does he realize who I am? At least he would just come and meet me. This is ridiculous. And he says, and I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. And so Naaman is so mad that he turns to go home. Dip myself in that filthy river, you must be joking. This is, this is ridiculous. And, and you know where I come from? They, they treat me with respect. This is, this is crazy. <laughs> you know what that's called? Now, you and I, let, let me just, let's just pause there for a moment. You and I look at the story, and we think, I'd probably feel the same. Because that is a bit ridiculous. You know, that's a bit rude. But you know, on, 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 on Naaman's side, you know what that's called? Pride. You know who I am. You should treat me differently. That's pride. And pride will get in the way of what God wants to do in our lives. Because he's so upset, which is rooted in pride, that he's not going to go that way. He's not, I'm, I'm not going. And fortunately, he had a servant who talked some sense into him. And the servant said to him, he said, I know this is ridiculous. And, and, I, and, I, and I know this is, this is crazy. He says, but if he'd asked you to do something difficult, would you have done it? I know you would have. Now he's asked you to do this very simple thing, very easy thing. I know it's a filthy old river, but let's just go and do it. Long story short, he does it. And God touches him, and God's he God heals him. What is the lesson for you and me? Pride will get in the way. Humility will make a way. When you and I walk humbly, it will make a way for us. Because God says in His Word, God gives grace to who? The humble. Humility will make a way. God will give grace. What is grace? Undeserved blessing. Unmerited favor. I don't know about you, but I, I want that. I want that. And so, so that, that, that little bit of pride that's hiding in the backyard there, I want to get it out. I want to deal with it. I want to say, Lord, please, Holy Spirit, you, you see that nonsense in my life. You just shine a big light there because, because I want to deal with this. Because I want God's blessing. Humility will make a way. And I'm telling you, I need God's way in my life. Amen? I want to pray for us this morning. Let's stand. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think we can ever humble ourselves enough in front of our God. And so let's do it this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you very, very humbly this morning. 
And we've, this is the second week we've spent on this, Lord, because we've just seen that it's, it's a sin. It's something that you hate. And it's also something that can block. It can get in the way of what you want to do. And so we come this morning with the same prayer as last week. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves before you have to humble us. And then help us to focus on other people and to serve wherever we can. As a matter of fact, to look for opportunities to serve. Never think we're above that. I don't have to do that. Help us to serve. And may we always walk in gratitude. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you.